Welcome to In Business Africa. I'm Nancy Kachangira. I'm at the St. Mary University Sports Facility here in London. Now, many great African athletes have trained on these very grounds, including the man who gave Botswana its first Olympic medal, Nigel Amos. On the show today, we're looking at the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the sports industry right around the continent. Here's a look at what's coming up. We hear how the cancellation of the Africa Basketball League launch is costing hotels in Senegal thousands of dollars in lost revenue. Why the reopening of golf courses in Zambia has thrilled business executives. It's not so much the deals that you strike on the course, it's the forging of, uh, of relationships. And uh, through those relationships that you forge, that's when the business comes in, business leakages and so on and so forth. And how the postponement of international athletics championships has affected the incomes of some of Uganda's top runners. In a bid to curb the spread of the coronavirus, many countries have had to suspend or cancel all sporting activities. This has had a huge financial impact on every aspect of sport, from the athletes themselves to organizers and broadcasters. Although we have seen the return of some major leagues and sporting events, it's still very possible that some clubs could go bust. The global sports industry is estimated to be worth close to 500 billion US dollars. Sports leagues mostly make their money through sponsorship and advertising, ticketing and hospitality, and the sale of media rights. It's too early to know the exact financial effect of COVID-19 on sports, but African sport has not been spared from the pandemic's impact. Basketball is one of the fastest growing sports on the continent. A few months ago, the Basketball Africa League announced that it was postponing its inaugural season. The season was supposed to begin on the 13th of March and 12 teams were supposed to take part. When it does finally take off, this will be the biggest event in men's basketball in Africa. From Dakar, Emeline Singinkosi has the details. Basketball Africa League president and NBA Africa managing director Amadou Galofal and his team have been working to grow the game of basketball on the continent for more than two decades. Then came COVID-19. We are very comfortable with the decision we have made to pause and, and continue to work to relaunch the Basketball Africa League at the right time, all pending the evolution of the COVID pandemic. but. Uh, you know, yes, we were disappointed, but it didn't really uh, last long because we realized that, you know, under the circumstances, the health and safety and security of all people involved, players on the teams and staff and the fans were anticipating a uh, great turnout at Dakar Arena. So, but, you know, obviously that was not the time for that and sport took a back seat. Another sector that was forced to take a backseat is the hospitality industry. Senegal has seen a steady increase in the number of tourists visiting every year. Between 2014 and 2017 alone, there has been an increase of over 40%. And sports has been pushing this growth. Imisen has been working in the hospitality sector for over 25 years and is the president of car rental company Hertz and the Senegalese Franchise Federation, as well as being the owner of two hotels in Dakar. We are a hotel business and we welcome a lot of teams. It should also be noted that our small hotel has 32 rooms. It hosts the national team. It's kind of their favorite hotel. An Emis hotel was due to welcome some of the teams attending the launch of Bal. Some teams had announced they would come and stay with us at our hotel and of course other hotels. But first, the NBA, we were right in the middle of it. They came and stayed at this hotel. So there has been a really negative and catastrophic impact on hotels. Overnight, Imi decided to shut his hotels even prior to the government's restrictions. And this has had a huge impact on his finances. We had to resort to loans to cover the most important expenses, that is to say, the staff mostly, to pay the staff. 
Even with all the losses due to COVID-19, once launched, the Basketball Africa League aims to boost the economy. Samuel Tuluwase, a basketball player and Nigerian international who has traveled all over the world playing sport at professional level, knows all too well the impact of sports on a country's economy. So the NBA is obviously one of the fastest growing businesses in America, right? So we have now that in Africa. So, you know, they've now come together and created a league in Africa for young kids growing up. And it should create a better life and a better energy for Africans who want to play the sport, who have the, you know, the ability to go forward in life and be a positive role model in their life as well. It's a better development program and it, it, it brings across a better infrastructure in the sporting industry. This infrastructure is also trying to nurture homegrown talents and allow them to flourish on the continent. I think it's an opportunity to bring sport in the mainstream. You know, getting governments and all stakeholders to realize that sport is not just for recreation. Obviously, it has all the health benefits that we know, right? Getting our youth in Africa to engage in healthy, positive social activities is paramount because, you know, they are the segment of the population that is going to take us to, you know, where we really need to be in, in the, you know, next decade. COVID has only momentarily postponed activities surrounding the launch. With the Basketball Africa League due to bring more opportunities for economic growth for both the continent and the players involved, it seems that COVID-19 has only reinforced the importance of its launch. Emeline Nsingi Nkosi brought us that report from Dakar in Senegal. It's one of the oldest sports in the world. Golf is more than 500 years old. But it's a sport that's only just starting to become popular in Zambia, thanks to a rising middle class. Now, back in April, authorities in Zambia banned all sporting activities in order to curb the spread of the coronavirus. Now, some activities are being allowed to resume, provided strict health guidelines are followed. And golf is one of them. Mutuna Chanda takes us onto the green in Lusaka. Wow. Awesome, there was some flow to that. Now, when you do attempt to hit this, iron the ball. Yeah, don't look where the toe is. Iron the ball and just go one, two, one, two. Putt. A few months ago, the greens on this golf course were empty because of restrictions on the sporting activities due to COVID. But now, they're springing back to life. The resumption of golf among a few sporting activities is good news for business executives such as Jason Kazidimani. He plays golf to ease the pressure of his work and to keep fit. He also uses it as a platform on which to discuss business away from the serious and formal corporate environment. So after a week of hard work, this is what the golf course means to him. Yeah. It's not so much the deals that you strike on the course, it's the forging of, uh, of relationships. And uh, through those relationships that you forge, that's when the business comes in, business linkages and so on and so forth. Yes, I have used the relationship I've, I've, I've made on the course uh, to get business, uh, meet new clients, and also entertain clients. Um, uh, every year, KPMG has been sponsoring uh, a big, big uh, corporate uh, golf day. And I dare say, I think it's one of the finest golf days in Zambia where we bring together all our clients and so on. The stronger the relationships you have with people, uh, the stronger your networks, and the easier it is to actually uh, get business and close the deal. So what was it like for him and other golfers during the suspension of sporting activities? I play at least uh, once a week, uh, sometimes uh, twice a week. So it was very, very hard. So it's very difficult driving past the golf course uh, every day and not being able to pull out your cl uh, clubs and go and hit a few balls. If you don't play it, you actually suffer from withdrawal sy uh, <laughs> symptoms. We were very, very glad when um, the ban was finally lifted. Bonanza Golf Course, as a club, faced its own challenges during the suspension of sporting activities. Heading into the new year, we went off with a nice start to the year and uh, obviously there was a little bit of uncertainty as we reached Feb, March. 
and during the COVID area we were closed for just short of a month and a half. From a golf course perspective it's, it's like a living thing so the maintenance costs on that don't stop. So extremely difficult period for us. Um, I think that government made the right call and fortunately we were able to get back into the game in a re reasonable time frame and the, the comeback's been very good so very happy with the way things are going at the moment. Some of the safety restrictions that are being enforced currently to prevent the spread of COVID-19 are that there are to be gatherings of no more than 50 people at a time. While the big events that bring together hundreds of people are on hold for now, golf enthusiasts and business executives continue to have a good time on the golf course. <laughs> Mutuna Chanda brought us that report from Lusaka in Zambia. This is In Business Africa on the BBC. Here's a look at what's coming up in the second half of the show. We speak to the Chief Executive Officer of a leading Pan-African football management agency. We've been working because it's a wake-up call for everybody. There needs to be a total paradigm shift uh, and just preparing to be ready when, when, when things come back to normal. We'll have that and more just after this short break, so don't go away. Welcome back to In Business Africa. I'm Nancy Kachungira in London. On the show today, we're looking at the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the sports industry around the continent. So far, we've heard about the postponement of Africa's premier men's basketball league, and we've heard how golf is picking up pace in Zambia. Now, let's turn our attention to a sport that's much loved around the continent, football. There's no doubt that football is lucrative. The world's 20 most valuable football clubs are worth an average of 1.75 billion US dollars each. Total revenue generated by these clubs in the 2017-2018 season was a record $9 billion. The top football leagues in the world are Spanish, English, German, French and Italian. In Africa, football is the most popular sport, but leagues are underfunded and often not well organized. Most footballers are poorly paid compared to those in Europe and other parts of the world. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, leagues and major tournaments such as the 2021 Africa Cup of Nations, which had been set to take place in January next year, have been postponed. With so many football matches cancelled, the sector's revenue flow has taken a huge hit. We've been speaking to Kingsley Pungong, the chief executive of Rainbow Sports Investments, about the fallout. We've been working because it's a wake-up call for everybody. There needs to be a total paradigm shift. We've been working to uh, establish new business model, exploring the digital, uh, looking at other ways that we can keep uh, customers engaged, fans engaged, uh, partners engaged uh, during this period, which has been very extremely uncertain, uh, and just preparing to be ready when, when, when things come back to normal. Tell us a bit more about that, because even before the pandemic, some clubs, especially smaller clubs, were struggling to raise enough revenue. And we have seen a shift where you've got digital providers now streaming more matches than a broadcaster, a television broadcaster, is able to. So when you say a wake-up call, what do you have in mind? A wake-up call because football is a business based on excitement. The fans are excited. And that excitement, in many cases, carries itself to the bottom. Some clubs overspend. And in, in order to, to, to satisfy the fans, which is dangerous and creates fragile business models. And so it's a time for people to take a back seat and make sure that they're more prudent and better prepared in the future to override such pandemics. So what are some of the ways that, that you think football will change after this pandemic? I think football will become more responsible in terms of spending. Clubs will hold bigger cash reserves, transfer fees will be more balanced, astronomical amounts paid for transfer fees. Will, will be a thing that will be put on ice for a while until clubs get, get stability. I think we'll see a lot of salary caps coming in, in, in leagues around the world, just to create the stability that clubs need in terms of a rising crisis. 
Now you're working with African footballers and you place a lot of emphasis on them being able to invest what they earn, especially back home. How is that being affected by the current crisis and does it change any of the plans that you have for this side of what you do in the future? I think as a, as a football investor, we normally invest in high level talent, we also invest in clubs and platforms around the world. We actually uh, uh, own us a football club in Czech Republic and own us a football club in Cameroon. I think it's affected every player because uh, it's been a difficult time. Some clubs in China and in Europe are discussing, uh, discussed and implemented salary cuts that has reduced the amount of money that uh, players as individuals invest in other ventures. Uh, it's a wait and see period and most people decided, players included, to play safe and, and, and retain a lot of what they earn. Uh, for rainy days, because nobody knew what would happen the next day. So it's, uh, it's, it's created a, a huge gap in the level of investment. I think it's reduced significantly. For us, as, as investors, it's been difficult in the short, short run, but also from a broader financial perspective, this is a time when pretenders are distinguished from, from real businesses, uh, in the sense that uh, it's a shock to the system. But those who survive will have the opportunity to invest heavily in distressed assets, which can become more valuable for the future. You work with both ends of the spectrum because you own a football club in Cameroon. At the same time, you sign players to major clubs around the world. What is the future of football in Africa for local clubs, local players? How should that business model be approached as a viable money-making venture? I think Africa has the biggest potential in, in, in global sports. If you look at the democratic shift, the, the demographic shifts today, uh, this increased urbanization, the, the under 30 population in Africa is the biggest in the world, which translates to more athletes, football, uh, there's a football culture, which means Africa has the possibility of producing more soccer players in most parts of the world. And it's about producing an African athlete that can compete internationally, have the same value, uh, and, uh, and, and, and tap into the economic benefits of the global game. That's one part of it. The second part is uh, it's about plucking Africa in the global football system. Africa is a huge consumer of sports, and it's only fair that African players be, and, and African uh, fans become a stakeholder in the game, not just as, as, as fans and as, as punters, but also in the boardroom. When we think of African exports, we don't always think of football, and yet this is definitely a lucrative sector for many Africans. And you are emphatic about Afri Africans investing, uh, your players investing back home and making a difference there and building a future beyond football as well. How would you say that these players are able to impact not just their communities, but the economies around them based off of football? And do you see that being heavily impacted by this current crisis? These guys are icons today. Uh, and have a huge role to play in terms of inspiring youth, in terms of the capital that they bring in terms of capital flows into the continent. These guys earn tremendous amounts of money, uh, and as we know, very little can go very far, especially in smaller African economies. And it, there's an opportunity for them to create opportunities in the different sectors beyond football. There are also spin-offs uh, that come with these personalities. So I think it's significant. Uh, the role this players play in Africa. And I think it will only go bigger because I think the more African footballers are yet to see. Uh, there will be more African players coming into the global league, the more African superstars, and that can only be a good thing for Africa. In Uganda, as in many other countries, sporting activities have been suspended since March. Sport professionals are now wondering when they'll be able to get their livelihoods back, and many venues have had to close. From Kampala, Darren Allen Cheyune tells us how some venues are going about finding a way to financial recovery. This may not be Uganda's most popular sport, but these runners are well known in this country. They make a living by participating in continental and international athletics events. Halima Nakai specializes in middle distance events. Last year, she won six of her 15 races abroad, including the World 800 meter gold medal. But with the global athletics calendar disrupted and sports events in Uganda suspended since March, her earnings have significantly dropped. 
has affected me to the greatest extent for sure. Because as the year started, I had a big dream. The main target was Olympics. But uh, I was shocked when the races, most of the races, they started cancelling them one by one. Of which, my target was now to work money because being a lady, I have to perform when my body can still deliver something. I know my time in sports is too short. So, when the races were cancelled for sure, it was a little bit disappointing. Last year, five Ugandan professional runners, including Nakai, shared more than 100,000 US dollars in gross prize money for taking part in the Diamond League, an annual series of elite track and field competitions. These athletes had been preparing for races in the build up to the 2020 Olympic Games, which have now been postponed to next year. They are, however, hoping to score on some of their 2020 financial targets when the global athletics calendar resumes in August. Now I'm happy, at least the lockdown is easing a bit. At least we can drive, we look for isolated places where we can train from. Yeah, it's a little bit, at least there is hope. Sports venues like these here in Uganda usually attract thousands of fans. But lack of activity has left many of them deserted. This is one of Uganda's most popular sports venues. But it's now more than a hundred days since players walked onto this pitch for a rugby match. And it could be months before fans are allowed into facilities like this one to watch their favorite teams. Revenues have dropped since the government measures to stop the spread of the coronavirus came into effect. The legends before COVID-19 and now two different things. The legends before COVID on a Saturday af uh, afternoon like this, um, by now we've got uh, rugby happening. Um, there are games on, on, on the pitch, there are people who are watching the games. You've got people seated watching the live uh, sports, whether football or rugby that is being televised. You've got people seated down eating food. Uh, right now the traffic has significantly uh, reduced. Uh, for very obvious uh, reasons. We've seen almost a drop, at one point we've seen a drop of almost 90% uh, percent of, of, of the revenue. The restaurant is helping to sustain the rugby club. The National Council of Sports, a government body responsible for the development and promotion of sports, recently formulated new guidelines for the resumption of sporting and recreational activities. And as the government authorities slowly ease restrictions, sports in the COVID-19 low-risk category, such as athletics, could get the green light fast. That report from Kampala, Uganda, was by Darren Allen Cheyune. Well, it's time for me to get off the pitch now, as that's all we had for you on In Business Africa. I'm Nancy Kachingira. From me and the rest of the team here in London, goodbye and thank you for watching.